Spurs Cast with your host, Paul Garcia. And welcome back to another episode of the Spurs Cast. On today's episode, I will once again be going solo. In this episode, I'll be discussing a new report of the potential for Victor Wembanyama to be at Summer League, what position the Spurs will be targeting in free agency, and a new detail from the new CBA that's coming out that emerged that will apply to the San Antonio Spurs. So let's jump right into this episode 701 of the Spurs cast. All right, here we go. All right, so it's topic number one. There's going to be multiple topics in this one. Um, this, a lot of this information comes from Friday. There was a bunch of news on different outlets that I really want to get to that, that address the Spurs. And then, of course, I'll give my take on those uh, by doing some research and talking about um, salary cap implications and things like that. All right, so the first topic is Wemby at Summer League. So according to Mark Stein of uh, on his on his Substack newsletter, he wrote this line in his latest uh, uh, newsletter from Friday um, regarding Wembenyama possibly playing against at Summer League with the Spurs. He said, the Spurs are hopeful, I'm told, that Victor Wembenyama will indeed be a participant to some degree in summer league play in Las Vegas. So that's that's interesting because as we as we know, if you've been following Wemby um uh over over in his uh French French league season, we know that his team got to the finals, they ended up losing uh in those finals, but he basically played a lot of basketball here. He played the regular season with this team, and then he of course he plays uh in, in their playoff system. And so we didn't know for sure if maybe because they went to full length all the way to the finals, if, if, you know, he would take the summer league off. But now this is interesting, this report from Stein, that there's a possibility that maybe Wemby ends up playing. So it could just mean that he goes to summer league with the play, with the team and maybe he, he works out with the players, run, uh, get some run in the practices, or maybe it means he plays in a game or two or, or multiple games. We don't know. Uh, there, there's a good chance of that. So we do know that the Spurs are going to be in two summer leagues this offseason. Uh, starting on July 3rd, they're, they're going to be in the, the California Classic Summer League, which is just two games against the Hornets on july 3rd and then against the lakers on july 5th and then from july 7th through 17th they're going to play in the vegas summer league which usually is about I think like five games usually it's what takes place um now so again i don't know for sure if he's going to play those vegas games but like stein says you know to some degree he's going to be involved there uh, with the spurs for a personal selfish reason i hope he does play because i'm actually going to be in vegas for part for the first part of the summer league for a few days so i'm actually hoping that when i'm there when ends up uh when ends up playing just because i get to see him in, in person here you know that's again that's just more so for selfish reasons so i am hoping that he plays but also it would just make summer league i think way more entertaining more enjoyable if we know that victor's gonna play in one of those games even if even if it's just one game that'll be really cool to see him um out there on the nba summer league floor and if not i mean again maybe he needs his rest and he doesn't end up playing and so then we, we have to wait till october to see him so uh, again uh that's that's just some good news if you are hoping that when Benyama plays in the summer league and just again based on when everything we i i've read before about him that he has that work ethic where he wants to play it's hard to keep him off the off the floor so that's going to be really interesting to see uh, if he does end up playing. So again, for selfish reasons, I'm hoping that he does play just because I'll be there, especially if, if it's on those days that I'm there. All right. So our next topic, this is from an article on Friday that came out from um, Jake Fisher of Yahoo Sports. Uh, he had a line in there uh, on his latest article. It was really about the Spurs and their chances of getting Chris Paul. Um, and then uh, just some player, so some potential uh, players that they're not, not players that they're targeting, but positions that they're targeting. So he mentioned that the Spurs might be targeting um, a center this off season. So I want to go ahead and go to his exact words. So again, this is from Fisher of Yahoo Sports, and then I'm going to tie it into a question I immediately got um, from from a Spurs fan um, on Twitter. So the qu- th- this quote comes from Fisher's article on Friday, and I do want to record note that I'm recording this on June 17th, this episode, a Saturday. So if there's new information that comes out after, then you all are, are aware of why that happened. Um, so here we go. So here's his quote. Let me just fix this real quick. Okay. So here's Fisher's quote. Uh, he says, further, there's a growing belief among league personnel that San Antonio will target starting centers this offseason, whether by trade or on the open market in- markets in free agency, to save Wembenyama from the brunt of battling against front court behemoths in his first season, the Spurs are also said to be high on Zach Collins' starting potential. So let's pick this this um, this this part of his article apart a little bit because I, I think there's a lot of interesting information in here. Uh, so so for number one, um, that's interesting again to see that the Spurs may be looking at a starting level center. So so there's obviously there's all the teams that that already have their starting level centers that they would have to explore in the trade market now. For, for this episode, I didn't actually take, um, I didn't actually dive into those teams just yet. I probably will in a future episode, but I did explore the um, free ag- some of the free agents that are starting centers uh, in free agency. So what I did is I, I usually every offseason I create a list of like players, mainly based based on height and their and the, the potential free agents. 
And I looked at players again. Uh, I, for this episode specifically, I targeted players that are from six ten and above. That's that's how, that's how tall they had to be. And I, I went back and looked and see and and saw you know this past season where they start starting level centers. And that's kind of in a, li in a little bit, I'm going to show you a list of the players that I, that I, that I, um, that I marked that I think that would be interesting for San Antonio to address that free agency part. Uh, and then and I do want to know too, about what, what, what um, Fisher mentioned there about Zach Collins. We know that before the Spurs knew they were going to get Wimbanyama, coach pop on, in that final week of the season, he basically went, went out and said, Zach Collins is a starting center next year. Now things obviously may have changed now that they know they're getting Wimbanyama. So Pop was probably just saying that, um, you know, because at, at that time they didn't know who, which draft pick they were going to have. But now that they know for sure they're having Wemby, maybe the organization is looking a little bit differently in a different direction in terms of do they want to have a different starting center out there. But like 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 Fisher mentioned, you know, the Spurs were very high in the year on Zach Collins. Um, he does have that that non guaranteed deal coming up for I think it's like seven million, and I don't expect them to waive him. So I think again, I think he's either going to be their starting center next year, or he'll at least be some, some uh, be, be an addition there behind Wembenyama or whoever that new five is um, as, as to provide some front court depth. So again. San Antonio is still high on Zach Collins. We don't ex expect it to see him leave the team. Uh, and then now to tie in this question with um, from Twitter, this this question uh, was from at Oscar Trashcan. Uh, he has the Oscar the Grouch um, uh, picture on, on his uh, on his Twitter profile. So you know, excellent there. So here's the question: um, uh, uh, Oscar the Trashcan asks, any chance of them San Antonio? bringing back Yaka Pertle as a free agent. So this is an interesting question because this is one I've also gotten from other fans um, online. They wanted to know, are the Spurs allowed to bring back Pertle this coming off season because they just tra traded him away? And, you know, there's always that, 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 um, that, that, that uh, criteria in the CBA where you're not allowed to bring a player back on your team unless like a full season is ended. So just to answer that question first, yes, the Spurs can bring Pertle back. And here's why. He was traded in February. Uh, and and so you're not allowed to bring him back during that current season. So they couldn't bring him back from the 22 to 23 season. San Antonio was not allowed to do that unless he went to like a third team and they got waived. That was the only case. But now since a new season is beginning, the CBA does allow you to bring him back as an unrestricted free agent. So yes, uh, to answer your question, the Spurs can bring him back. Now, what will it cost if they do want to bring him back? Again, I'm not reporting that they are, but if they were to go after Pirtle, what would it take? It would take, according to Bobby Marks of ESPN, Again, most likely a salary in the range of 15 to 20 million per year is what Pirtle's going to be looking at as an unrestricted free agent. So we know that the Raptors are probably going to be very aggressive in trying to bring him back just because they already traded a first round pick for him. So they probably want it back just because they already spent assets to go and get him. But they knew this was the gamble they were taking, that he was going to be an unrestricted free agent. Uh, they didn't have a chance to extend him. So there is a chance that maybe the Spurs or another team, uh, you know, goes after him and just pursues him aggressively with, with, the, with the, um, the big offer like that. So again, if the Spurs want Pirtle back, they would they would have the cap space to do that. They would have to clear, um, you know, they can clear anywhere from like I think it's like twenty three million to like forty something million in cap space. So yes, they could definitely get that number of uh, fifteen to twenty million somewhere in that range to get Pirtle. And I, I think it would be a benefit just because he, he's a good defensive center there, and you let you know Wemby will be there as the four to do a lot more on of the on the offensive end. Uh, Pirtle already knows the Spurs' system. He's been there. He was their anchor for for most of his his time when he was there with San Antonio. So he, there, there's familiarity. Um, so, so I think, yeah, he, he'd be a good, um, option if the Spurs did bring it back again. I don't know for sure if they will. Another player, I, I, I've gotten mentions about this player on Twitter. And also I think he's a good, um, you know, starting center is, uh, B Brooke Lopez of the, of the Milwaukee Bucks. He is an unrestricted free agent as well this off season. And what, what, what's interesting for San Antonio is that he can, um, the Spurs can basically, um, outbid Milwaukee for him if, if that's what it takes in free agency. So we know that according to Bobby Marks that, um, Using his bird rights, the Bucks can only extend him for uh, three years for 54 million, which comes out to 18, 18 million per season. So, if you're another team like the Spurs that wants to acquire, try to sign Lopez away from the Bucks, then you have to probably throw a deal that starts um, over 18 million dollars because that's more than what Milwaukee can um, can sign him for. Now, according to the, the, the a lot of the, the different podcasts that I've been listening to, um, you know, different outlets like Yahoo, um, uh, ESPN. Um, uh, Yes, uh, the ringer also like just different outlets. I, I've heard that from, from what I've heard from the, from those from those outlets that that it looks like right now early signs are that that the Bucks do want to bring back Lopez and also Chris Middleton. So right now it looks like that he would uh, want to go back to Milwaukee. And you know you look at his case. He's 35 years old. He's been with the Bucks. He knows their system. Um, he, they're still a championship level team with Giannis there in his prime. So I, I could understand why he would definitely want to resign with Milwaukee. So that's why if you're a young team like the Spurs, you're one, you're, you're obviously getting using the money to try to get him because you're trying to you're trying to sign away from Milwaukee to leave that chance of contending for a championship right now. And instead being like a foundation to help, uh, um, you know, help Wemby grow into the system into the NBA kind of life in the first, you know, one to three years. So that's why 
why you want to try to convince him to come join a young team like the Spurs, who's, who's up and coming. And that's what they would have to do is basically use, use the more money part of it if they want to try to sign a player like Brooke Lopez. That's if San Antonio has any interest in him. Another player who I found interesting that's going to be a free agent or could be a free agent, I don't know if he will, is Chris Asporzingas. Uh, he has a player option this offseason for $36 million uh, that he has to decide on by June 21st. So, he, so basically, again, I'm recording this on June 17th. So he has four days to make that, that decision if he's going to opt in or opt out. According to Bobby Marks, if he does opt out, then um, th- maybe he wants some some long-term security. So maybe he, he could seek a lower salary in year one, like at $27 million, as what Marks mentioned. And so that's why... If he opts out, then I think that's where you're, if you're San Antonio or a team that wants to sign Porzingis, then you would look at 26, 27 to like 36 million, which is way more than what Pirtle or probably Brooke Lopez would get. Um, so, so again, your your uh, Porzingis would, would cost you as a team more uh, to try to sign him. Uh, and 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 then if he opts into his uh, his player option, well, then he's going to be on the on the Wizards roster. And then of course you would have to try to trade for him if you want him. So again, there's no there's no um, rumor that the Spurs want Porzingis. I know I think in the past there was there was a rumor when he was still at the Knicks that the San Antonio was one of those teams that had interest in him. But again, I don't know if um you know if it, if it works so well alongside Wembe, he's a really good player, more offensive talent, uh, more offensively talented than probably Lopez and, and Pirtle. But doesn't give you like that that backbone um, of defense that, that the other two players do. So again, I just thought I just find his name interesting in, in terms of starting level center. So that's why again I'm playing I'm paying attention to these specific players. Another player who's a starting level center is Nikola Vucevic of the Chicago Bulls. He is also an unrestricted free agent. Um, he's going to be 33 this coming season, and I just don't know uh, I I don't know any specific salary of where he's going to start at what what his level would be because we know he's a former All Star but but you know he's he's um, He's not quite that level anymore uh, at this point of his career. So I would just say because there's no salary range for him, I would say he's more in that Pirtle kind of camp where you or like Lopez, like 15 to 20 million is probably what you have to try to try to have available if you want to try to go out and sign Nikola Vucevic against uh, away from the Bulls. Again, that's if San Antonio were to have interest in him. And the last player um, is, is, you know, he's a star, he's a starting level center. He started for a lot of games for the Mavericks last year is Dwight Powell. Um, he's still pretty young. He's, he's 31. He's uh, six, six, 10. Um, I don't know exactly how much you would need to sign him. I think he's definitely a player who would command, um, you know, a little bit more than the MLE, which is going to be 12.2 million this offseason. So I think a deal north of 12 to like 15 million is probably what, what Powell's seeking uh, in free agency. So again, those are some starting level centers that I see uh, that would, if, if that's what the Spurs are targeting in terms of free agency, those are some players who come to mind. Um, I, I haven't, like I said, I haven't had a chance to look at the trade, uh, who they want to look at as far as for trading for, but these are some players that are interesting. And again, that also answers um, Oscar that, trash cans um question there about Pirtle. yes the spurs can bring him back if they wanted to try and resign him so again that's that's interesting that's something to keep an eye on is uh starting level centers whether it's in a free agency trade or even maybe even the draft maybe the spurs try to move up for a pick maybe they want to start uh, you know a center there all right so that was the second topic let's go to our third topic now this one doesn't apply specifically to the spurs but it's it's one also that i've been um, asked about from from multiple um uh people so this one comes from a report on Friday as well from Bleacher Report's Chris Haynes. Uh, he's, he's saying that the, the Indiana Pacers are putting the seventh pick on the table for a trade, uh, and, and here's, here's what they want in return. So according to Chris Haynes of Bleacher Report on Friday, he wrote, the Indiana Pacers have made the number seven pick available for a trade, sources tell Bleacher Report. The Pacers are said to be in the market for a starting caliber wing. And of course, you hear starting caliber wing if you're if you're, if you're a Spurs fan, and they have, uh, f- fans have already been asking me. But of course, we know that you know Devin Vassell is not going to be on, on the uh, trade block for San Antonio. So then the next player is a, is a younger player too, who uh, just signed an extension last year, and that's Keldon Johnson. So that's the player that I've been asked about by different people. If uh, the Spurs could swing a trade with Indiana for Keldon Johnson and that number seven pick, how would that work? And so I'm just going to mainly be here to answer that question of how does it work if that's the case. So there's two timelines that the Spurs and Pacers, uh, if they were to agree to a deal like that, like Keldon for the number seven pick, how it worked. There's the first to get a deal done before July 1st. So if you're doing a deal before July 1st, well, then we know that Keldon Johnson's season uh, salary for this current season was 3.8 million. So you got to find a, a deal that has 3.8 million or, or kind of matches up there if you're Indiana. And if you're doing a deal after July 1st, um, after the new CB, after the new season begins, then Keldon's um, new salary in 23, 24 b- bumps up to 20 million. So to answer this question, there's two routes. If the Spurs and Pacers were to do a deal before July 1st, then a player from Indiana would need to be sent back close to like that, that uh, $3 million range. So that a player like that could be a role player like Jordan Nora, who only has one year left on his deal at 3.2 million. So again, you could send, you could see this, the, the Pacers sending Jordan Nora and, and the seventh pick for, for Keldon. 
uh, in this scenario. And what this does is if they do this before July 1st, well, then this gives the Spurs more control of that seventh pick in terms of they would be the ones who, who get to decide exactly who, who they want to, to draft with that seventh pick. Is there a player that they want to, they've, they've been trying to move up to get? I know I don't know where he's supposed to go because I haven't done an update in mock draft, but I know a player that they've worked out for sure is Jarris Walker. Who's who's like he plays like the center position? So I don't I don't know if he's supposed to go. Um, I haven't done my mocks recently in a few weeks, but I don't know if he's supposed to go, not fall to seventh. But if he is in that seventh range, well then hey, there's a player right there uh, that that just comes to mind. I'll, I'll be able to ask one of our, our draft experts, ben, Benjamin Bornstein, also in the future uh, about that if if the Spurs were to move up to that position. So again, San Antonio has a little bit more control with that pick if they were to get that done before July first. That would be the incentive to do that now. Or if they wait till after July 1st, then uh, this this part would, would require the, the Pacers not to send back a player to San Antonio because now that when the when the offseason begins on July 1st, the Pacers can open up to $27.1 million in cap space, which means they could absorb Ke- Kelton Johnson's $20 million salary. So that's exactly how it would work, the two timelines. Again, the, the Spurs and Pacers, if this was the, the trade package proposal, they could get a deal done either before July 1st, which requires Indiana sending a player, or after July 1st, which doesn't require the Pacers sending a player. Now, uh, in terms of my opinion on this, if I'm Indiana, I, I don't know if that's enough for the seventh pick. So I, I just, just Kelton. So maybe they're asking for a second round pick. Maybe they're asking for a future protect, protected first. Again, I'm not quite sure what is needed to get a deal done or are the Pacers getting better offers from other teams in terms of um, starting caliber wing. So again, those are the, the questions that I'm asking uh, if, if I'm on the Pacers side. So I, I don't know if that quite gets it done. But again, just to answer that question that I've been getting asked about, that's how a deal would get done if the Spurs and, and Pacers were looking at a deal for Kelton for the seventh pick. And again, I'm not I'm not reporting that they are. It's just a question that I've been getting asked a lot, and I wanted to answer it here on the Spurs cast. And the final topic here is also a new detail that has emerged about the CBA that um, Jake Fisher of Yahoo Sports um, reported on. Uh, and and it's, it's something I kind of addressed, but now that there's a new timeline that I want to that I want to get to in terms of this new detail. So, according to, to Jake Fisher of Yahoo Sports, this has to do with the minimum team salary. So let's listen to what he said. He said, or wrote, another facet of the new CBA will mandate all teams reach the season salary cap floor, ninety percent of the overall budget prior to training camp. So this is interesting because the NBA ha- and hasn't quite um, they haven't put out the actual full CBA agreement yet. Um, and you know, July 1st is almost here. They should have had it out by now, but so it's taking a little bit longer. And so what this means is what it does is they had sent a memo out a few weeks ago or about a month ago, I would say, uh, where they said that you needed to be at the minimum team salary by opening night. So what this does, this new, this new report from Fisher is that it kind of moves the timeline up by a little bit, by about two weeks. So we know that opening night is usually about mid October, um, you know, using the 15 to like twenties, that, that date range. And so that's when you should be at the minimum team salary. Now, Fisher's reporting that you need to be there by training camp, which is usually about October 1st, or like the last few days of September, September 29th, 28th, that kind of range. So that kind of means that 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 a team like the Spurs, who are projected to have cal- salary cap space, they need to be at that 90 per- that um, salary minimum team salary by training camp. So that 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 makes it more of a priority to spend your money, whether it's going out of signing free agents, whether it's trading for players on big contracts then yes, there is an incentive this in terms of how you're addressing this offseason in July in terms of, of, of meeting that, that floor. Now, what happens if you don't meet that floor, that, that minimum team salary, then you will only get 50% of, of the tax distribution if you're a team like the Spurs. So that's why there is an incentive. You do need to um, try to reach that, that limit before uh, that new date of training camp. So what do the Spurs need to do? How does this apply to them? Well, the minimum team salary is 120.6 uh, if we have a 130, $134 million salary cap. So if the salary cap comes out as, as it is projected at 134, then the Spurs need to get to 1.26 uh, or more in team salary by the time training camp comes. So the Spurs right now, they could reach that easily if they have all their cap holds. That's basically all those free agents that are still on the roster, like Romeo Langford, cap hold, Trey Jones, um, Mamu, all those kind of players. Now, if those players walk away, which again, we don't expect all those players to resign with San Antonio, if those free agents walk away, then the Spurs do have to meet a number. They have to meet $22.6 million to get up to that $120.6 million number. So again, the Spurs will have to either go out and sign some free agents or trade for some players with large contracts in order to get to that number. Because again, I, I know that you know, they don't, they don't want to be that team that gets penalized by, not, by, by, by missing out on a 50% tax distribution. So yes, that, that's interesting again to note because we know that for sure I think San Antonio will be a more aggressive in terms of adding salary to the team, whether that's by trade or by signing free agents. So again, I think that it's not going to be one of those quiet summers where the Spurs have 20 plus million in cap space going into training camp. They have all this money and they're not spending it just like we saw this past year. Now there is an incentive for teams like the Spurs 
who will have salary cap space to spend that money. So again, uh, this is just uh, an episode again, just to kind of get through a lot of different new reporting. I found it very interesting. And also like that, that, that detail about the CBA was very interesting to me. Uh, we'll continue to record more Spurs cast. I'm going to try to get an episode up um, before the draft comes on Thursday, uh, trying to get our, our draft expert, Ben Bornstein on the podcast. I'm going to try. I know that schedules are always a little bit difficult uh, at this time of year. Everybody's busy but with, with, with the draft coming up and then free agency and all that. So uh, I'm going to try to get a, a, a draft episode up. If not, I'll also be recreating short videos on YouTube anytime there's like new tra trade rumors or things like that coming out, just because this is this, this is the time now. These next two or two to like four weeks are, are going to be a, a bit wild here with the, with the Spurs' names and different rumors and things like that. So thanks for listening to this episode of the Spurs cast. I also want to say thank you to Joe Garcia for mixing and producing this episode. From all of us at Project Spurs, stay safe and have a great day.